Good morning. Welcome to Christ the King. This the uh, final, final weekend of July already. Last night I said, the end is here, and people were like, oh! I said, well, the end of July at least, and everybody calm down. Welcome to the Lord's house on this beautiful, man, these are the days of North Idaho, aren't they? Wow. Coming in this morning, and it's nice and cool and crisp. Uh, we welcome you in the Lord's house, I'm Pastor John Muley, and we have uh, one of our members who we've talk, we talk a lot about him, but we don't get to see him much, but this year we get to see him a lot more. Uh, uh, Pastor Reverend Dr. Scott Rishi, one of our members who's part of PLI International, um, usually he's out bouncing around the world. Uh, that's not so possible in these days. Well, I mean, it kind of is, but it's not so possible to gather people like you normally do for training. And so he's been uh, working remotely. Uh, last month, we spent a, a couple nights uh, calling Russia and Central Asia, and he was working from like, what, 10 to 4 a.m. or 5 a.m.? So those are unusual work hours, um, and um, so we're blessed to have him here. Uh, and we're uh, having this time for him to be the liturgist. Next month, he's going to be uh, uh, contributing to the Summer in the Psalms, and he'll be uh, preaching for us and sharing some more about his experiences overseas. But today, you're going to have him uh, sort of eased in and be gracious to him. He's, he's in the back saying, it's been a while since I've done this. And, uh, and so he's learning our ways as well. And so we're very thankful to have him here with us as we welcome you also. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, if you are... Um, if you were at all wanting to have a large print bulletin, we do have them in the back. We can uh, get them for you. And so if you want any, uh, just let Todd know and he will make sure that you have them. We welcome everybody who's joining us online. Today's going to be also a little bit unusual because if you look back in the corner, you'll see Martha and you won't see an organist. Maybe you noticed that we didn't have an organist, but we are actually trying out. There's a program to do it all through the computer. So Martha is our organist today. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, be gentle to her. She's had zero lessons on the organ. I'm pretty sure that's true. Is that right, Martha? So there we go. Uh, but uh, actually, it works out really well. We went through it and run through it, so uh, you'll still be blessed in these unusual days. So we're just adding to the craziness, because we don't have enough this year, right? We, we just need more. So uh, we're going to keep on going that way. But in all the craziness of life, the things that are constant for us, as we now have mask mandates, we have now all these things that have changed, the thing that remains constant for us is Jesus as he comes to us. And today he comes to us in the gifts of his word, and uh, so we're going to be focusing on uh, what that means for us as we look at Jesus and, and God's word as the wisdom of God. That's going to be our focus in the Psalms, and you'll see that in the readings and in the uh, songs as well. So there was one last thing that I was asked to do, and so I'm not in trouble because it's not my responsibility. I'm just giving that heads up, but Dan told us that it is Sandy's birthday today. Oh, hands up in the air. Yeah, yeah, here it goes. So uh, let's take a moment and sing happy birthday to Sandy Elkins. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sandy. Happy birthday to you. And in Russian, uh, when I was talking to a lady uh, who was one of my staff, she said, uh, I am 39 again. So happy 39th birthday again. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> He's digging that doghouse deeper. I, I hope the couch is comfortable for you tonight, Dan. But uh, <laughs> So... In this day of laughter and joy, we are in the Lord's house, and what a joy that is. So why don't we rise and join in singing our opening hymn. Sick in 
mine sight to the inly brind. O oh, now to humankind let there be light. Spirit of truth and love, life give me. God has given us this gift of being able to be together for worship, and so we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But, but if, if we, we confess, confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment just to consider our lives and those places in our lives where we've broken our relationship with God and even with those around us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most, Most merciful, merciful God, God we confess, confess that, that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die and rise for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done his miracles, and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant. Children of Jacob, his chosen ones. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Father, your holy 
be with you and also with you let us pray almighty and everlasting god give us an increase of faith hope and love that receiving what you have promised we may love what you have commanded through jesus christ your son our lord who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit one god now and forever amen you may be seated Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to leave my mask on because I didn't think about, I, I like this mask that I have, but it's a tie-on, and I didn't think about the ease of taking it off, and I was mixing my mic up and the strings back there, and so I, I'm just going to leave it on. I hope you don't mind. So we're all going to be children today because uh, we're all children of God because while we don't have any families here this morning, we do have people viewing. Uh, when I checked about uh, right after, it, during the first hymn, 32 people, uh, 32 screens on with us this morning. So, uh, so that's 50% more than what we have in here. Uh, where our numbers go up 50% more. So that's, that's pretty cool. So today we begin talking about wisdom. But before we, we think about that, I've got some books here to, uh, to think. So... We used to homeschool. Uh, Raina was, was homeschooled up in, uh, through for, fourth grade. So these are some of her books that, that she used. We have uh, Beast Academy Math. So it's a good, good smart. I've, I did not have math books that look like this. Uh, a, uh, a graphic novel math book. I, I may have enjoyed math a whole lot better if, if I did that. But So we have math. We have the story of the world, ancient, uh, activity book three, modern, early modern times. So a history book, okay? So all sorts of uh, history. We've got some maps in there. Then we have building foundations of scientific understanding, a science curriculum for kindergarten through second grade. So these were all great, great books. Raina learned a lot. She, she stayed, in fact, she's probably ahead of, of the game in a lot of cases. But these all mattered with being smart or knowledge. That's different than what we're talking about. Today we begin, as we're looking through the Psalms, the Psalm of Wisdom. Wisdom does not come from these books. But I have one more book. It's my uh, hands-on Bible, my, my, child, my children's Bible. Wisdom doesn't deal with this. It deals with this. As we look in the dictionary, wisdom talks about being able to discern or understand the inside, have good sense, have good judgment, not know what that one plus one is two or uh, from Queen Elizabeth the first to the, to the 49ers, not certain 49ers, but, uh, or, or various scientific things. Those all are up here and have to deal with understanding the outside world, the natural world. But God gives us his word, 
and it talks about the good sense and understanding inside, the relationship that he wants with you and with me. But there's also wisdom of the world that turns us away from that. But that's why we have this book. And that's why we read this book and get into this book and why we come to church or view online because that's how we hear God's wisdom that keeps us close to Him in relationship to Him. The good sense for the path that He has put us on and the path that He has restored us to because of Jesus. For every time we walk off, He wipes us clean and places us back on the path. And His path, His way, His wisdom doesn't always make sense to the world, but we can rely on it because He gave it to us. And He's written our future, now and for all eternity. And that's the gift that we have, that He gives us that wisdom and he knows our hearts because he's transformed them through Jesus. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me, for loving me and transforming me and transforming me and making me yours and making me yours. For giving me your wisdom, for giving me your wisdom and your word and your word so I can read about it. So I can read about it every day. Every day. In your name we pray, Jesus. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So with our focus being on what Eric was exactly talking about with wisdom, uh, our psalm today is a psalm of wisdom. So there is a whole subgenre of wisdom literature in the Bible. Most often we think about it in terms of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes written by Solomon. There's also the book of Job. And, and there's also in certain psalms, wisdom uh, literature uh, type motifs that we see coming forward. And so Psalm 49 is one of those where we hear the psalmist speaking, saying, hey, listen up world, there's something that God wants to remind us about wisdom. And some of what we're going to hear are things that may unsettle us a little bit as people, because oftentimes as we, we think uh, about who God is and who he is speaking to us, uh, Psalm, uh, Isaiah 55 might come to mind, that his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are higher than ours. And so we hear godly wisdom coming down, and it speaks into our world in a way that may uh, catch us off guard or, or shift our thinking, but in part, that's part of God's wisdom for us, that we hear rightly through His Word. The Old Testament reading from Psalm 49, verses 1 through 20. Hear this, all, all peoples, give ear all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom, the meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb, I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence, yet after them people approve of their boasts. Like sheep they are appointed for Sheol, death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases, for when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed, and though yet you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So that last line of, of verse 20 of that psalm really connects to the next reading, which is James chapter 3. That man in his pomp without understanding, without heavenly understanding, is lacking what God would have us have. And we see in James 3 that he makes it a distinguishment between wisdom of this world or what he calls wisdom of the earth, which is the, a lot of what we heard in the first reading, wisdom that is not of God, versus the wisdom what he calls from above. And he in, in, exhorts the church, exhorts you and me, James does, to be people seeking after true, divine, heavenly wisdom. The epistle reading from James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns, and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Down through 
Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we continue in the Psalms through all of June, or July and August, we're talking about different themes that speak into our lives. And I was thinking about how I would love that there were more wise people in the world right now. I don't know if you feel that at all, but boy, it seems like we are at a dearth of wisdom, and I certainly feel like I could use a lot more, and uh, I know that I look and I pray for my, our leaders of the nation, of our county, of our cities, uh, of our world, and ask that God would continually grant them more and more wisdom. But when we think about wisdom, that's actually a word that we know kind of what it is, but when you think about the definition of it, it, well, it's not really helpful. I was trying to figure out how would I even kind of start the groundwork of, uh, of, of the defining of what we were talking about today. And so, of course, I, I did what Eric mentioned, is to look at the, at the dictionary definition, which was this, and it's like the quality of being wise. Well, that's really not helpful. I mean, it's like it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really land anywhere. And even more so, it really sounds like experience and, and uh, uh, judgments come through uh, times of trial and figuring it out. And I thought, well, and so I started looking around for other places. And so there's a, a YouTube uh, channel. If you haven't seen it, I highly, highly recommend it. It's called The Bible Project. And they have all sorts of uh, videos, short introductions to each book of the Bible. They have all sorts of things that uh, can really be helpful to how to understand certain motifs, certain themes, certain uh, biblical concepts. And one of them they had a video on was about the wisdom literature of the Bible. And so what they talked about was how wisdom was really uh, seeking, biblical wisdom was seeking to answer two main questions, which are, how do we understand the world around us? And then how do we live well in that world? And that wisdom is really seeking to answer these questions. And I thought that was much more helpful than the the dictionary definition. Because really at the heart of of these questions is a, a phrase that's not just concerning Christians, it's not just concerning followers of Jesus, but rather all of us as people want to know how to live the good life. And wisdom is trying to define what does the good life look like, and then how do we go about doing that certain thing. And if you think about wisdom, uh, as we were talking about it from uh, that, uh, the, the, uh, the dictionary explanation of what wisdom looks like, I think oftentimes we think about it as something that we gain through trials and problems, through learnings, through seeking out other advice and such, and such like that, that it's something that we can find as we travel down the road. And so there's some certain paths that we often think about this, that we who are younger go to those who have, have walked further down the road of life and can speak into us in times where we need help. So it's sitting there saying, Dad, how do I do my finances? Or Mom, how do I help uh, raise my kids in these troubled times? Or whatever the questions are, oftentimes we think about it that we have a mentor, we have a guide, we have a a parent or a grandparent that speaks into us and says, this is how we should be, and, and, and that we receive his wisdom and we try to apply it in our lives so we can live the good life. 
But you can also, if you just go into Amazon.com, find all sorts of books like this one that uh, purport to sell you and tell you how you can live a wise life. And I, you probably can't see the, the little uh, subheading under the wisdom codes. It says, ancient words to rewire our brains and heal our hearts. Because that's what we want, right? We want to change the way we think in our hearts so we can live the good life. But oftentimes, and and the way that I think many of us encounter it is in social media, whether it's Instagram or or Facebook, that one of your friends posts something like this and you get a whole bunch of hearts and likes, thumbs up, you know, and and so we go, oh yeah, yeah, these these are things that we can look at and say, oh, this is helpful and it's a good reminder, it kind of resets a little bit of our day and and helps us focus through. But honestly, sometimes the words of wisdom, well, they're just a little bit more like humorous and not really trying to say too much that's of seriousness, right? But sometimes they're just there to kind of give us a reflection, and so we take them all in, and, and so the goal is how do we process all of this stuff that tells us different uh, uh, facets of our life, and how do we answer that question, well, what is the good life? Well, of course, there's lots of things in the world that speak into our lives and our existence about wisdom. And, and in truth, as we already discussed, there's parts of God's Word that does this as well. And so if you were to think of a, of a story or a person in the, God's Word that encapsulates the sort of search for wisdom, who would that be? Solomon, Solomon right, right? Because it's the, it's the story of 1 Kings chapter 3, where, where uh, Solomon has just been coronated, uh, replacing his father David, and he is, uh, he is in this dream, uh, able to have a dream with God, which would be pretty cool. And God comes to him and says, hey, what can I give you? And Solomon was wise enough not to do that thing that I always thought would be, you know, like the genie pops out of the bottle and say, can I have a hundred more wishes, please, kind of thing, right? He didn't ask that. Instead, he said, uh, I would not want the things that maybe you thought. I would want like uh, success or money or a beautiful wife or lots of power. Instead, he said these words. Let me read them to you. He said, and now, O my Lord God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. So give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I might discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? And so it was with that response, God was pleased with Solomon and he gave him wisdom. And all of those things he added to as well. He said, because you asked rightly and you sought from me uh, to learn from me, I will grant you wisdom and much more. And, and that story that we see in 1 Kings 3 says something very simple but very profound. That the source of wisdom is from God. That true heavenly wisdom is that thing that we should seek after. And it informs us something that, that we should hear as well, because there's all sorts of wisdom out into the world, but it's not that God has left us alone in speaking to us. He, in fact, imparts to us all sorts of wisdom. And so when we think about that, a helpful way to be reminded is what, is what Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 3, that as we're going through life, we'll make paths and we'll have ways that we go about, but we trust in the Lord and lean not on ourselves and know that as we're walking, He is going to, in His divine wisdom, refocus and remove us and reshape us to be uh, taken path, and that as we trust in him, that's what it means to fear the Lord. As we trust in the Lord, he will actually guide us and lead us, not through our own eyes of what we always assume might be wise, but through a heavenly divine wisdom that he imparts to us. And, and that's all in the background of this uh, wisdom literature that is in God's word that speaks into us, that, that God is going to guide us through this process. 
which should help us to think about uh, wisdom in terms of this Venn diagram. Venn diagrams are just basically a way of comparing and contrasting. And so on the one hand, you might think of the red circle being the wisdom of the world and the blue circle being the wisdom of God. And what we should rightly understand is that there is places where those two overlap. But there are times where they're divergent as well. And so into that place where the wisdom of the world's one way and the wisdom of God is on one other way, what do we do? Well, hopefully as Christians, we, we think and we hear God speaking to us, even though the, the answers of what it means to live the good life, the answer of what it means uh, to be wise uh, from our heavenly perspective versus the earthly perspective might not be the same. And so into those moments where we're asking fundamental questions about the good life, we can start to see how they diverge. Because look, for example, this idea of, of the good life can be defined in terms of this, happiness. We are told in our Constitution that this is something that we should pursue in life, right? And for sure, we as Americans are working really hard to pursue happiness. There was a book written in the 1980s by a guy named Neil Postman who, whose title of the book says it all, that we are amusing ourselves to death. We chase after happiness. In fact, oftentimes I hear it said now uh, that the way we define our morality even is by happiness. Oh, my son wants to do this and that and I don't approve of it, but at least it makes him happy. Maybe you've heard that said. But, so that seeking of happiness is, is an answer that the world says, this is what wise people do. You seek and pursue happiness. And biblical truth says, no, no, you seek first the kingdom of God above all else. It's a totally different answer to the question of happiness. Our, our goal isn't to pursue happiness, but pursue Jesus and his kingdom. And all these things shall be added to you, he says. Or the question of identity. This is a huge one right now going on uh, in our country. It's divided by um, whether or not you are a mask wearer, right? In lots of places, that's how we are identifying ourselves. It's whether or not you b agree with the president or you vote according to his policies. It can be uh, based on your race, your sexual orientation, how much money you make, uh, what's, what sports teams you follow, because everybody knows it's the 49ers, right? Uh, all these things that we identify ourselves with. Right? These are, these are ways that people say to really live the good life, align with this sort of identity and stand proud in this identity and find, your, uh, find yourself in these ways that we label ourselves. But Christians say a different thing. Our identities are, are found in the work of the cross and in the waters of baptism where we are united to Jesus. And in this water, we are washed clean and made children of God. We are adopted, Paul says in Galatians chapter 4. And so no longer we are enemies and strangers from God, working against God, but instead we are made his own and we find our identities in that. Come what may in the world... The good life is to live in that identity as God's child. And if you ask the question of what's the purpose, there will be all sorts of books that will try to help you find your purpose in life. There's all sorts of people that are going down different paths trying to seek this answer, whether it's to make as much money as I can, to have as much fun as I can so I can get a lake of front property and a boat on the lake and spend all my weekends there. It can be uh, having as much uh, social media presence and people liking me and having as many followers as I can and being loved and taking the most beautiful pictures that are all filtered so the my flaws aren't shown, all of these different purposes that people have. And against that, the wisdom of God in the good life is that we who are children know our Father and we grow in that relationship. And it happens through worship, it happens through praise, it happens through prayer, hearing Him speak to us in His Word. All of these different ways that define what biblical wisdom would say is our purpose, which is definitely apart from the world around us. And so as we start to think about that question of what is the good life, we can see that there are places where divine wisdom diverges from the earth's wisdom or the worldly wisdom. And that's what James is really saying, and that James is really reminding us is that as we have these divergent paths, that we should follow the one of God. But that's super hard. 
And let me tell you a story about what I was reading this week. So, uh, I, uh, you know, this whole year we've been going through the Bible reading plan. So whenever I'm driving around, I have uh, my, on my phone and I plug it into my car and I listen while I'm driving. And so this week I was at the, the famous chapter that you all love, Second Chronicles 18. Yeah, right? When's the last time you read Second Chronicles 18? Not for a while, probably. So here's what's going on there, because I hadn't thought about this story for a while, and suddenly I was thinking about it. I'm like, wow, this really fits into what we're talking about. So there's two kings. Israel is now divided. The kingdom of Solomon, uh, of David's and Solomon's time, has been split to Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And Ahab is the king of Israel. And Jehoshaphat, that's a great name. I don't know what his parents were thinking, is the guy in the south. And those two are about to go to war with Ramoth Gilead. And you go, huh? Yeah, exactly. And so Jehoshaphat goes to Ahab as they make this alliance, and he says, hey, let's inquire of God before we do this. And Ahab's kind of annoyed by this because he doesn't really believe in God very much. He's not really following. He's worshiping Baals and other gods. He's like, okay. So he calls all of his prophets in, and all of the prophets are like, God says, go for it. And he's like, awesome. And something must have caught Jehoshaphat, kind of like, this seems odd. He's like, do you have anybody else we might ask? Well, there's this guy, Micaiah is his name. But here's, here's the exact quote. I wanted to quote him exactly, about what he said about him. He said, we can call him, but I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. So they called him, and he spoke truly God's word and said, don't do it. It'll be a mistake. God is not going to hand you this victory. And so Ahab ignores it, goes out and gets killed and loses. And I was reflecting on that, how the wisdom of God often feels like what Ahab received. Because sometimes when Jesus speaks to us, it's not what we want to hear. Think of the gospel lesson today. You mean, Jesus, that you want me to think differently about my money? Right? That was kind of that parable was a, a word of wisdom from Jesus speaking into us. Or think about other places where Jesus talks. Oh, uh, if, you, um, if you really want to be my disciples, love your enemies and pray for those who are persecuting you. I don't want to do that. Or uh, if you think about how Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. So you mean, Jesus, that, that my forgiveness is connected to yours somehow? And I can do that seven times, right, says Peter? No, no, 70 times seven. But I don't want to do that. That person's really annoying all the time, and you want me to continually forgive that person? Or Jesus says, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. And we go, I don't want to do that. I want to punch them back. <laughs> There's all sorts of moments where divine wisdom coming and speaking into our lives isn't what we want God to say. And that's our struggle. And it's really a cost of discipleship, the struggle of our lives following Jesus that can be summed up in this verse from Matthew 16, where he says, if you really want to be following me, you got to do a couple things. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. So you mean, Jesus, that I have to lay down all my vision of what the good life looks like to follow you? Yeah. Yeah. And you mean I have to pick up a cross? And we often interpret this in our modern times is that we're going to have to bear some sort of burdens. We're going to have to shoulder some pains for following Jesus. No, no, no. That's not how first century Christians, the, the people that heard this would have understood. You mean I have to die. I have to be willing to surrender all to you that you might kill me of myself and make me alive through faith. Yeah, that's what Jesus is saying. And then I have to follow you. You mean I don't get a lead. You're not going to follow me, Jesus, when I want to go live the good life? <laughs> Oh, no, 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 follow me, surrender all, and come. That's a hard word, isn't it? And when, we, when the rubber hits the road, when we really think about divine wisdom, it's hard for us to want it and to do it. We hear these words and we say, no, no, I'm still going to go to war, it'll be all right. But you see, there's a reason why we follow these paths. And it's not just because it's for our good. In fact, oftentimes it doesn't feel like it's any good for us. But rather, it's what Jesus uh, is uh, called in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul talks about the fact that Jesus is God's power and his wisdom. 
And what he's really talking about here is this idea that the cross itself, to those outside of, of Christianity, look at it and say, that is a stupid idea. It's foolishness. It's, it's, it's utterly useless. And yet we who know the true work of God in the cross see it as God's wisdom for us. That the, that the end of wisdom results in Jesus. That the very wisdom that we know is, is the word who speaks into us as he came in the flesh and as he did that thing which people thought foolish. Because people look at the cross and say, you mean to tell me that an innocent man is going to die for the guilty? That's absurd. Yeah. That's absurd love of God. You mean to tell me that death is going to be defeated by death? Yeah. Because Jesus lives. You mean to tell me that in the cross there is something that transforms us? And that's what we say, yes. This foolishness of God is wiser than the wisest wisdom of this world. And it's in this work of Jesus, the wisdom incarnate in the flesh, in our lives, who changes and transforms us to see why we follow all these other wisdoms of God. We get back to these questions. And the cross and the empty tomb inform us. What kind of world are we living in? Well, right now it's a crazy one, isn't it? It's a broken one. It's a divided one. It's a hurting one. It's a tired one. It's one where people are at each other's throats proverbially and sometimes, unfortunately, really. It's a world that we fundamentally see as flawed and broken. And how do we live well? <laughs> we find our identity in the cross and in the working of Jesus. We see that we have been transformed from strangers and enemies to children of God. We find that we seek that kingdom. We find that in that promise, God is speaking into us and telling us our purpose to know him now and forever. You see, that's the wisdom of God that redefines our worldview, the way that we see things. That's the, that's the heart of this wisdom literature that speaks into us and says, you may see things this way, but God wants you to see them this way and to know who you are as you navigate this world. And that, that is the good life. How do we do that, though? The first one I want to say is to listen, right? Because if Jesus says, follow me, we need to hear his voice as he's walking us through this world. We need to be in the cycle that we listen to God's wisdom as it comes to us through his word, through his gifts, through other people. And, and we hear that speaking into us. We listen and then we go and we live it out. Wisdom that is simply in your head and in your heart, never applied into your life, isn't wise at all. It's just pithy phrases. Right? The connection of wisdom known is wisdom lived following Jesus. That's why he says... Deny yourself. Stop thinking about the ways that you would define wisdom and let me inform you what true heavenly wisdom is and come and do and live in me. And that's a cycle of rep repetitive way of being, that we listen and we go and live and we mess up and so we listen again and we ask for forgiveness and we repent and we're forgiven and then we go and we live it again and it's a cycle of how we apply the wisdom into our lives. All of which is a focus on Jesus. Because there's lots of other places that you can look for wisdom. There's lots of other answers that will give you worldly wisdom. But what the biblical idea is, is to hear God's wisdom. That's what the psalmist says in Psalm 49. Listen up! I've got wisdom from God I want to share with you. And we know that the fullness of wisdom is Jesus himself. That's what has been shared with us, and that's what informs us and, and moves us as we seek to answer that question of how do we live in this world and how do we go about living the good life. Or to put it in a totally different way, the very first sermon of this year in January, we looked at another psalm of wisdom, Psalm 1. I don't know if you remember that sermon. I do. I preached it, and that's how it goes, right? Uh, uh, and Psalm 1 is talking about that there are mockers and scoffers and the wicked around you, and you don't sit with them, you don't stand with them, you don't listen to them. Instead, if you are wise, you will be like a tree planted by streams of living water. 
And that, that roots will go down deep and will be nourished and, and fed by that living water that flows into you and gives you strength, even among times of droughts, even when life isn't good, even when there's suffering and pain, even when there's problems, even when the world seems to have no wisdom, we are rooted in that nourishing water of life. And we talked about that in terms of that God in his word speaks to us and nourishes us through that word that reminds us of who we truly are and what he has truly done and gives us that refreshing life throughout every day of our life. And it's a good reminder in these days as as I feel that our world is just parched and thirsty for something wiser and truer than what they know they need. And Jesus is that source that fills us up as he comes to us in his word, as we're reminded of our identity and our baptisms, as we taste and see that the Lord is good, as we hear other people speaking to us these promises of God into our lives, this divine wisdom, all of these ways help us to grow and be fed and nourished in difficult times. Because Jesus is our wisdom. And so we're rooted in that water that wells up to eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we continue on uh, by uh, confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I'm going to invite you to remain seated as we uh, confess our creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we think about the fact that we uh, have been given much by God, and part of his wisdom is he teaches us that we are to give back a portion of what he's given to us in thanksgiving for all that he's given to us, but also to put ourselves in a place where we're trusting him for what we need. And so see the offering as a way for you to be able to do that. If you're here this morning, there's a basket as you leave, and you're welcome to leave your offerings there. Uh, If you're home watching online or unable to be here, or even if you're here, you're also able to use uh, many different ways, as you see on the screen, uh, to be able to give your offering. And that supports the work of God in this place, uh, but also puts us in a place where God can do his work in us and through us. And so let's continue by standing and singing together the offertory. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the invite you to join me as we come before our Lord in prayer. Lord God, we joyfully lift up our hearts to you, thankful that you freely promised to hear us through your Son, our one mediator, Jesus. Therefore, hear us as we bring to you the prayers for us and for our community and also for the world. God, our Father in heaven, we praise you that you have given us true wisdom through your word that points us to your Son, Jesus, who is your power and wisdom. Teach us to grow in faith shaped by the wisdom from above in acts of love and kindness 
guided by your Spirit, and at all times be governed by your Son, who is our way, our truth, and our life. Lord, as you promised, hear our prayer. Grant that your kingdom will come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to come to you, to know you by faith and to find their righteousness in Jesus Christ, your wisdom, and that the number of Christians may be increased. We pray in particular for missionaries J.P. and Amy Sima, that you would bless their labors for your kingdom in Cambodia. We also ask that you would bless your church in the Central African Republic, causing it to flourish even amidst persecution. Lord, as you promised, hear our prayer. Jesus, just as you sent out those first apostles into the world to go and make disciples of all nations, we ask that you would use us, your disciples, to be a part of that work. Today we ask you to bring to mind someone in our lives who does not yet know you. Lord, give us, we pray, the confidence to share your love with them and the opportunity to do so, and then the words to say in that situation. We ask that you would use us to be about building your kingdom. Lord, as you promised, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, and in the midst of both good and evil things that our own wills be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we therefore commend Jackson Conley, Irma Clayland, and Doug Marine, praying for those who grieve their deaths at this time. Remind us of the hope that is in Jesus, who is our resurrection and life. Lord, as you promised, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, look upon all those in difficult situations due to continued spread of COVID-19, those potentially affected by the hurricanes near Hawaii and Texas, those who are underemployed and unemployed, the lonely shut in, those facing addictions, the vulnerable and those in need of a miracle in their lives. We especially call out to you this day on behalf of those hurting in body, mind, and soul, each according to their needs including John Halverson, Jim Kaiser, John and Barb Hensley, John Jameson, Flo Dunlop, Marge Reich, Candy Comer, Lou Vandermark, Christian, Bob Smith, Jill Dawson, Carolyn Richardson, Juana, Gary Widmer, Ivy Hake, and all others we silently name before you now. Lord, as you promised, hear our prayer. Almighty Father, you call many people to serve in dangerous occupations. Look upon Dwayne Close, Daniel Glenn, and Brad Johannes as they service in the military. Protect those who serve as first responders and in law enforcement with Ben and Ryan and Doug and Jay, with Eric and Kyle and Ryan. Lord, as you promised, hear our prayer. We joyfully trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We sing our final hymn.
again, thanks for having uh, you with us today, Pastor Scott. We enjoyed your presence in our community. And as we go this day, go filled with joy and peace and serve the Lord. But first, go ahead and be seated. We'll help you escort out in these unusual times. One other announcement that I did forget, which is tomorrow at 1 p.m. will be Jackson Connolly's uh, um, Celebration of Life service, which will also be here as well as online. So we have sent out a link to that, and just a reminder that we would love to join you as you feel comfortable in these days. So we'll have a couple people helping uh, uh, usher you out, and God bless you this week for a good week in the Lord. Have a great week.